But I think that's a good thing. We really do need, as people of God, to convey to the world that one who lives the Christian life is going to live the best life that can be lived. It will be joyous and hope-filled. And the world doesn't get that, but it needs to. And we can convey that if we live our life as a Christian as God intended it to be lived. So encourage him. I'm grateful he's your preacher and I hope he is here for many, many, many years to come. Now, it is time for us to turn our attention to tonight's study. I'm going to ask you one more time to use your imaginations for a moment. I want you to picture a small town butcher shop. And in the window of that shop, there is a sign which reads 100% pure rabbit sausage for sale. I'm told that the local meat inspector was made aware of the sign and determined to make a surprise visit to the shop. He showed up unexpectedly and demanded of the butcher, is this really pure rabbit sausage? And the, the man caught off guard, began, be, began to stammer, and, and he said, to be honest, we, we add a, a little horse meat for coloring. But the inspector had been at it a long time. He said, well, what do you mean by a little horse meat? And the butcher replied, well, well to, to be honest, uh, uh, about 50, 50. And the inspector said, and what do you mean by that? And the butcher said, well, to be honest, one horse and one rabbit. <laughs> you had me concerned for a moment. You ever notice that things are not always what they're publicized to be? I have found that to be true in so many areas of life. I'll get an advertisement from a store, I don't need to name any store in particular, and they'll have something that catches my eye at a price that I think seems more than fair and I will go, or more likely I'll send my wife, and I'll say pick that up for me and she'll get there and they'll say I'm sorry we're all out of that but we can sell you this, which is comparable. It costs a little more, but it'll do the same thing. And the reality is often when they advertise those things, they only have a few, or sometimes they don't even have any, but that's okay because false advertising just occurs and we become accustomed to it. I look at politics and I don't know, I'm not going to get political here, but the truth of the matter is I don't believe anything the politicians say. Somebody asks, when is a politician lying? The answer is every time they open their mouths. You just, and I'm not being one party or another here, it's just that politicians tend by and large to tell their constituents what they think they want to hear. I don't have a lot of respect for people like that personally. And pe preachers are not far behind. They often form their response to questions of a religious nature on the basis of the answer they believe the questioner is seeking. Because heaven forbid they should say anything that might be offensive and put their job in jeopardy. The reality is any preacher who ever thinks about his job when he's in the pulpit needs to get out. Because our purpose is to preach the word of God in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine as Paul instructed Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. And it really doesn't matter what you think as long as we're faithful to God and God's word. And the moment we start compromising, we need to completely stop preaching. 
Because the truth and only the truth will free us from the condemnation of sin, enable us to live in the light of God's word, and ultimately be in his presence eternally. The text that we're going to be using tonight comes from the epistle of James. I'll be focusing primarily on chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. But I want to quickly tell you that chapter 1 can be broken down under three headings. The test of trials, verses 1 through 12. Everyone faces difficulties, heartaches, and disappointments. There are no exceptions. Some may face more than others, but everybody's life has difficulties. How we respond to those difficulties is entirely up to us. Some do, uh, in the face of difficulty, simply respond in rage. They get angry and blame God and walk away. At the moment they need Him most, they turn their backs on Him. What a tragedy. Others respond in resignation. It's just the way it is. I will continue to deal with it and go through life and just basically eat, just take it a day at a time and no, I'm going to be miserable. But James says, my brethren, count it all a joy when you face various trials. You're to rejoice in the face of adversity as a child of God? Yes. Is it easy? No. But can it be done? Certainly. And that's the challenge that James laid before his readers in the first 12 verses. In verses 13 through 18, he used the same word, but in a different context with a different meaning. He talked about temptation and invitation to sin. And he said, when it comes, and it will come, and it will come frequently, know that God is not the source. God is not tempted, and he doesn't tempt anyone. What happens is we just let the devil get a hold of our hearts or minds. And he plants seeds, and rather than rooting them up and kicking them out, we let them germinate and grow until eventually they produce lust, and lust leads to sin. And that's not God's fault, that's ours. But we can do something about it if we choose to. He says, do something about it. Don't give the devil the upper hand. You say, you mean if I have a bad thought, that's sin? No, I'm not saying that. That's how the devil attacks, you just don't let those thoughts live in your head. As he tosses them in, you kick them out. You may have heard what Martin Luther, the great Reform Reformation preacher, said about that. He said, I cannot prevent the birds from flying over my head, but I sure enough can keep them from building a nest in my hair. The devil is going to do everything within his power to lead us from God. But the promise of God is he can't succeed unless we surrender, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. So you're going to be tried, rejoice, knowing that out of it God is going to make you stronger. You're going to face temptations, invitations to sin, but you don't have to surrender. Stop making excuses and put up a fight. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Resist him and he will flee from you. So you've got a test of trials and a test of temptation. And then I would suggest to you, beginning in verse 19 and through verse 27, what we have is a test of truth. It is a simple fact that James tells us in these brief verses what we need to do in order to succeed in the great Christian endeavor. And uh, I am not going to have a PowerPoint tonight because I'm not smart enough to get it to work mm -hmm. this evening. That really helps me, by the way, because I don't have to look down. Now I can look at you, I can read your faces, and know what you're thinking. Oh, if only that were true. Let's look at the text. Verse 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Then he goes on to say, folks, you need to be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. In verse 26, he says, if a man seems to be religious 
and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. And then in verse 27, he goes on to say pure religion. That tells me if there is pure religion, there must also be impure religion. Doesn't that seem to be a proper conclusion? Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father's lives to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself or oneself unspotted from the world. Now, I want to suggest to you tonight, as I talk primarily to the church, that we need to be determined every day to make sure that our religion, our relationship with God, the faith that we profess is pure, not impure. I don't want any impurities in my relationship with God. And if there are any, they're on my side, not on his, because he's perfect. He's given us the perfect law of liberty. He gave us his perfect son who showed us in his life and in his words how to live and how to relate to people. And anytime I am off course, it is not their fault, it's mine. And that happens. We're all flawed people. There are none that do good and sin not. No, not one. All sin comes short of the glory of God. But I want you to know God is still on your side. He understands our limitations and our weaknesses. He does not understand, however, our willful disregard of his word and his way. When we just look at what God desires and say, I don't care, I will do as I please, all bets are off. But if you're genuinely striving every day to be governed by God's word, God's grace, God's love, and Christ's blood will continue to provide the cleansing that all of us need based on 1 John 1 verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us of all sin. The word cleanseth there in the original is in the present active indicative. You say, what in the world does that mean? It means that we're talking about an action that is ongoing or continual. If you are a faithful child of God, you can pillow your head tonight knowing that it is well with your soul, not because you have lived a flawless, sinless life, but because Jesus lived that life for you and gave his blood to redeem you and continues, if you are in Christ, to provide the cleansing that all of us need from time to time. And the world, sadly, doesn't know that. And often, even in the church, we don't. I've done a lot of counseling over the last 50 years, and if I were to categorize the issues that plagued brethren most, I think at the very top, that's taken more time than anything else, is the fact that God's people, long ago forgiven by the Father and cleansed by the blood of Christ, have still not learned to forgive themselves. If there are sins in your past that you have repented of as a faithful child of God now and sought forgiveness, leave them in the past. They will only hold you back and keep you down. You don't need to concern yourself. Like the Apostle Paul, forget the things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before or ahead, pressing on toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus from Philippians chapter 3. Again, folks, let's walk out of our buildings and show the world what it means to live the abundant life that Jesus calls us to live. He said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. One modern translation says, live it to the full. If we're not happy in Christ, we're not going to be happy anywhere. And if we're in Christ, we have no reason to live with anxious hearts and fearful souls. Because no matter what happens, we know that on the other side... It is well with our soul. We're on the winning team. And heaven will be our home. I think we've done a really good job, just my observation, of preaching 
and teaching, the very basic and fundamental things of New Testament Christianity. We talk about worship and we gather on the Lord's Day at the appointed time as God has instructed us to come together around the table to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. We sing with spirit and with understanding. We come before the Father in prayer in the name of Jesus. We have the opportunity to contribute, to return to God a portion of what he has first given to us. And every aspect of our worship has a biblical mandate behind it. We're doing a great job of that. And I hope we never stop. And we teach the truth about the nature of the church, the body, the kingdom of Christ. And we teach the truth about how one becomes a citizen in the kingdom, a member of the body, a part of the church. We emphasize faith, repentance, confession, immersion, and faithfulness. And we must never stop. But what's killing us, and I'm speaking very generically here, I don't know you well enough to speak with uh, specifics, but what's killing us is that we're doing and saying all the right things on the Lord's Day and then walking out of our buildings and our friends and neighbors and co-workers are saying, we don't see any difference in you than in us. I read a bulletin article many years ago. I wish I could remember who wrote it, but I remember the title. Mondays are killing us. Have you heard this little ditty? Mr. Worldly went to church. He never missed a Sunday. Mr. Worldly went to hell for what he did on Monday. I want you to think about that seriously. And again, I have no one in mind tonight. This is a very general, message based on a very specific text that says pure religion involves more than doing the right things on the Lord's day in the right way. As important as those things are, they will never compensate for our failure to live for the Lord every day of every week of every year of our lives until life ends or Christ comes. And I believe James makes that abundantly clear in this brief text from verse 19 through 27. So, I want to suggest to you, based on these scriptures, that there are four elements to practicing pure religion that go beyond the things we do and teach on Sunday morning in our worship to God and in relationship to salvation. And here they are. Go back to verse 19 and then to verse 26 for a moment. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. One of our elderly members, she was 101 at the time and in a nursing home in Marietta, looked at me one day from her bed and said, have you ever heard this? A wise old owl sat in an oak. The more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be like that wise old bird? I'm amazed what I've learned over the years from the elderly. I hope when I'm old, I'll have some wisdom to share as well. Take that smile off your face, Mr. Hatfield. <laughs> Isn't there a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth? Life and death are in the power of the tongue, Solomon said. There's an old adage that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That is an abject lie. Some of the deepest, harshest, most cruel wounds we will ever experience in life are word wounds. And we're going to have our share of them. James is saying, brethren, make sure you're not inflicting those wounds on others. Know this, verse 26, if you seem to be religious but do not bridle your tongue to deceive your own heart, your religion is vain. Well, why is that? Well, Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 told his disciples that it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. If you want to know what someone truly is on the inside, just listen to them for a while and they will reveal themselves by the words they use and the way they use them. 
And Jesus went on to say there in Matthew 12 that the time will come when we will give an account of every idle or careless word that we have spoken. James is saying you want to practice pure religion, it begins by guarding your tongue. And he doesn't just say that in chapter 1. Read chapter 3, especially the first eight verses where he says the man who can control his tongue is a perfect man and able to keep the whole body in check. So I know as I speak to you tonight from this letter that it's a message that I need, that you need, that we all need. Watch your words because people are listening and they're watching and they will judge the Lord and his church by what they hear from us and what they see in us. What do the scriptures say? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Ephesians 4, 29. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Colossians 3, 8 and 9. Among the things that the old man must put off, blasphemy, slander, filthy communications, vulgarities and profanity, and lying. In essence, if you really parse the text, the Apostle Paul, who is an inspired author, says, as a Christian, before I speak, I should always ask three questions. Is it kind? Is it pure? Is it true? And if I cannot answer in the affirmative to all three questions, then I should just be quiet. How many problems in the church could have been avoided over the centuries if people had just followed this very easily comprehended directive from above? And we watched our words. Our prayer ought to be the prayer of the psalmist. Is found in Psalm 19, verse 14. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And my friend, God hears every word we utter. And parents, so you do your children. If you don't want your children using certain words, don't use them. Don't use them in the home, the workplace, the community, or anywhere. Because they're not compatible with your New Testament faith. And it does matter. It doesn't matter on the Lord's Day if you worship correctly and if you teach the truth about salvation and a whole host of other things. Your lips can betray the true sentiments of your heart. And I'll go a step further and tell you based on what I know in Scripture that it's not just what we say. It's also how we say it. You can say the right things in the wrong way and do tremendous damage. That's why you find in Proverbs, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. And a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So the Bible does tell us, if we want to practice pure religion, we've got to watch our tongue. Are you squirming a little bit? Are you a little uneasy that maybe you've not been doing that the way you should? Well, don't just be uneasy about it. Do something about it. And I will tell you up front that I know it's not easy to clean up one's language. There was a time probably 25 years ago when I was away in a gospel meeting and when I came home, my secretary said, somebody called for you. They sounded like a nut, but they want to speak with you. So I returned the call. The next day, I stopped by and visited with him. Within the year, he and his wife were both baptized. And he said to me, Roger, I for my entire life have taken the Lord's name in vain. He says, I know that's not right, and I don't want to do it, and I'm desperately trying. And he's got tears coming down his cheeks because he can't quite get a hold of what he needs to do. He said, am I going to be lost eternally? 
Well, as I've told you earlier, I'm no one's judge. But I happen to believe, based on what I read in Scripture, that this is the kind of response that God is calling for. He knows we're imperfect. What He wants from us is the effort, the resolve, the determination to do the best we can do. And He knows that sometimes we're going to fail. It's the people that don't care and don't try that are in real jeopardy. Not the ones who keep trying and failing and get up and move on again. I tell folks all the time, our God is not a God of second chances. Our God will give us as many chances as we need to get it right if we just keep making the effort. He's on our side. He's pulling for our success. Read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. But we have to do our part. You want to impact your home, your community, your place of employment? Watch your words. Use pure words. Say kind, encouraging things. Don't be so critical. It takes absolutely no talent and very little intelligence to find fault. Find something positive to say. And say it in an encouraging way. And it may change a person's life, and it will definitely change yours. Are you getting worried? That's just point one, and I told you there are four. I would be. The second important aspect of pure religion is described in verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. The word visit there, by the way, is from... Oh, a word that is also used to describe the elder as a bishop or overseer. It's not in any way implying a social call. It talks in essence about seeing needs and responding to them appropriately. As I may have mentioned last night from Matthew 25, 31 through 46, I was hungry and you fed me. Thirsty, you gave me drink. This is what God expects his people to do, to have compassionate hearts. Not just a few, but all of us. Without a compassionate heart, we cannot engage in pure religion. When Jesus was asked on one occasion, what is the great commandment? He said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he did something they never expected. He said, and love your neighbors yourself. That's the second commandment. Which led someone to ask, who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, anyone you meet in need whose needs you can address. You say, where did he say that? We said it when he told that beautiful story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Don't be a priest or a Levite who just pass by and do nothing. Be like the Samaritan. Recognize the need and do what you can. And by the way, that doesn't mean do as little as you can. Do as much as you can. That man dressed the wounds. He loaded the victim on his donkey, took him to the inn, cared for him all night, paid the expenses, made arrangements for the continual care of the victim, and said, when I pass through, I'll pay anything else that is owed. That's real compassion. That's what God calls forth from people who practice pure religion. You think you can get to heaven and not have a compassionate heart? I will tell you, if you do, you are wrong. Because a compassionate heart is an absolute essential element of pure, upright, acceptable religion. I know we can't solve every problem, we can't meet every need, but God is simply asking us to do what we can where we are with what we have. And when our resources are limited, then we seek the assistance of others. And this is what I know of God's people. Whenever there is a real need, 
They always rally to the challenge without exception. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it's not the big things that I'm so much concerned about tonight as I talk to you from this letter about pure religion. It's the little things that we generally either let slide or try to pass off for someone else to take care of. When God is depending on me and you. Do what you can to take care of the less fortunate represented in verse 27 by widows and orphans. But it may be someone who's lost their job or had a financial setback going bankrupt and they're just wondering how they're going to get by. You see these kinds of things all the time. Let these folks know that we care by doing what we can and in the process practicing pure religion. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25. And remember what John wrote in 1 John 3. You see somebody in need, and I'll just paraphrase, you say, I'm sorry, I hope things get better, and you go on your way. What good have you done? My little children, verse 18, let us not love in word and in tongue. And the idea is exclusively, but in deed and in truth. Back up your sympathy and compassion with real action. And when there is no action... I believe the scriptures will tell us there isn't any compassion. And without that compassionate heart, there's no hope of heaven. Three, still in verse 27, not only must we have a compassionate heart, the text demands that we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I'm not surprised when I pick up the newspaper or read the news online by all of the stuff that's going on in our world. I expect that in the world. I don't expect it in God's church and neither does he. He calls us to live upright lives if we're going to practice pure religion to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And that doesn't mean that we go off on some mountaintop in a cave and hide out. That's the opposite of what New Testament Christianity is all about. It means that though in this world, we're not going to let the world into us. We may be in, but we're not of it. But we're going out into it, and we're going to tell the story of Jesus with our lives and our lips. And Let me underscore, you're never going to be successful telling it with your lips until they see it in your life. There is an order. Luke wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He never asked of others what he did not do himself. And he lived the only absolute perfect life that anyone has ever lived. He did no sin and guile was not found in his mouth. He was in all points tempted like as we're tempted, yet without sin. That's our standard. We're striving for it. We will never reach it this side of eternity. And God knows that, but we can do better. What are we talking about here? Let me suggest just three things. Honesty. Dishonesty in the world is a given. Dishonesty in the church, it shouldn't be there. Paul wrote to the saints at Rome in chapter 12 of the Roman letter, verse 17, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And you may, as Bible students, recall that he was involved in collecting contributions among Gentile churches to assist their Judean counterparts. He did that in such a way that he appeared in every possible manner to be upright and honest before God and men. As all Christians are to live. Integrity is the second word. H.D. McKeon said on his first visit to Oxford, what I found here that was most impressive is that I met 3,000 men, about 3,000 men, each of whom would rather lose a game than play a game unfairly. That's what integrity is all about, uprightness of character. What do you think of Job's wife? He said, where did that question come from? I'll tell you, I, I don't like her. I just don't like her. 
And I know there's a difference between love and like. I love everybody, but there are people I don't like. You want to talk about that later? I'll be happy to talk with you about it because the Bible doesn't tell us to like everybody. It tells us to love everybody. And I don't think Job's wife is very likable. The man lost his children. He lost his wealth. And he lost his health. And here's his wife's response. Curse God and die. And then she asked, how long do you maintain your integrity? You know what he said to her? You have to read all the way over to chapter 27, verse 5. But there he asserts, till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. That should be the attitude of every child of God desiring to practice pure religion. Don't compromise when it comes to right. Stay with the right, stay with the word, no matter the repercussions. That's what men and women of integrity do. The third word is truth. I think you understand what truth is. I know that the world is filled with lying, but it shouldn't be in the church. In fact, does not Paul say in Colossians 3 verse 10, lie not one to another. Why? Because you put off the old man with his corrupt deeds and put on the new man which is renewed according to knowledge. There it is. Bridal tongue, compassionate heart, an upright life. But there are four. Now I want you to go back and begin in verse 21 and read through verse 24, 25. Where James says, don't be a hearer of the word, but also a doer. Just hearing won't get the job done. You have to act on what you've heard. That's exactly how Jesus closed the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, in Matthew 7, when he told the beautiful story of the wise and foolish builders. If you hear but do nothing, you're like the man who looks in the mirror and walks away and he doesn't remember what he saw. It does him no good. But the one who hears and does, this man shall be blessed. So the fourth element of pure religion is an obedient heart. Not just a compassionate heart, but an obedient heart or spirit. Know what God demands and then commit to doing it to the best of your ability. Unless that happens, it doesn't really matter how compassionate your heart is, how careful you watch your words, and how pure you may appear to the world, if you haven't obeyed God and aren't continuing to obey Him, your religion is still not pure. It is vain and worthless. What do I mean? I mean, if you want to practice pure religion, you've got to be in Christ to begin with, part of His glorious church. And there's a clear formula to follow. That is not the least bit difficult to understand. You hear the gospel story. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. And I suspect all of you know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Jesus came into this world conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. When he was about 30, he was baptized by his cousin, John. Shortly thereafter, he entered the wilderness where he was tempted and following those temptations, which he overcame, he began his ministry that lasted less than four years and ended on a cross. But in his dying, he gave to all who seek it life abundant and eternal. But he demands that we respond to his sacrifice in faith, repentance, confession, and immersion. I'm not really interested in getting you in the water. There's a baptistry behind me. I've noticed it's full. My goal is not to get you in the water. My goal is to bring you to Jesus, and then we won't be able to keep you from the water. I know that because I've read Acts 8, the story of the Ethiopian nobleman. He's reading as he travels home from Isaiah when God, through the angel and the spirit, dispatches the preacher, evangelist, Philip. He says, do you understand what you read? And he said, I, I don't know. Does the man speak of himself or some other? And he invited Philip to join him. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, and preached Jesus. And as they went along, the man said, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 
And Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized the eunuch. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that he saw him no more, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, because he's now a Christian. And the blood of Christ has cleansed his soul, and the Lord has added to the church this godly man who was lost until he learned of Jesus and obeyed him. And now he goes home to practice pure religion. And that's what God expects of us. And we can do it. The challenge is to believe and obey. Because that fourth element is an obedient spirit. It's a simple text. I think I've been faithful to it. I know it's something that I need reminded of frequently. I suspect you as well. Let's never forget how important it is to bridle our tongues, to have compassionate hearts, to live upright lives, and possess obedient spirits. We might not be perfect. We'll still fall on occasion. But then with God's grace and God's help, we get up and we keep going forward, knowing that the end of the journey, we will hear the wonderful words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. We want that not just for ourselves and our families. We want it for the world just as God does. He wants more than anything else for you to be in his presence eternally. And it's your choice. Make the right choice right now. Come to Christ as we stand and sing.